Hi, this is Nancy Cohen from Global Ascension Network. I'm really pleased today to have with me Kimberly Whitman. Most of you know Kim. She's our leadership coordinator for the network. She's here today and I've asked her to come to teach on accessing the heavenly realms. I know that you're going to be really, really blessed by what she has to share with you. And as many of you know, she's a very anointed woman of God that's been ascending and descending for several years. So we can learn a lot from her on how to really move in the mystical realms. Okay, so hi, my name's Kim Whitman, and I am the Ascension Trainer for all of the Ascension Leaders here at Global Ascension Network. And Nancy has asked me to share with you all today some things that Father has put on my heart. And so we're just going to jump right in. The Father put on my heart today to talk about seeing, especially as an Ascension trainer and an Ascension leader. I hear quite a bit about, I can't see in the Spirit. How do you do that? I don't feel like I'm seeing things and that type of thing. And so Father really put on my heart today to speak to that and to just encourage everyone that's watching this that we truly are sons of God created in His likeness and image. And so we're going to go through that a little bit. During ascension, of course, seeing can be any number of ways, not only seeing with your natural eyes in the natural, but seeing in the spirit. As you all know, it's also perceiving, it's feeling, it's smelling, tasting. All of those things can be encompassed in seeing. And the various times throughout our lives, just because we are sons, the Lord's going to teach us and train us to mature those different areas of sight. And so there may be times that you see things in the natural just easy, and then all of a sudden that stops and you're not seeing like that anymore, but you're feeling things or you're smelling things all the time. And it's simply because the Father is maturing us and not only our spirit man senses, but our physical body senses and how to engage with Him in both the spirit realm and the natural. For me, I have been a seer my whole life. My parents have stories of when I was little of different instances where I was seeing things, and this was even before they were believers. One particular time, I think I was three, and we were over at some of their friends' house, and they put me down to sleep, and I called my dad into the room, and I told him, Daddy, there's a big shaggy dog walking down the hallway. And of course, this family did not have a dog, and so my dad went out to tell the family what I saw. And lo and behold, that shaggy dog had been tormenting the husband for quite some time. And so it really confirmed for them that I was actually seeing things in the spirit at a very young age. And so all of my growing up years, both of my parents are believers, I was encouraged in that to share with them what I was seeing. And it was never a thing of, oh, that's not real, or that's your, just your imagination, or you need to quit that. But it was always encouraged to not only share with them what I was seeing, but what I was perceiving in what I was seeing. And I think sometimes we, we discount the things that we actually see, we learn to discount them or not really pay attention to not only what we're seeing, but why, the why. And so that's really important to begin to mature that area of spiritual sight. In 2 Corinthians 3.12, I wanted to read this to you. It says, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. And that portion right there, great boldness of speech, really stuck out to me. Holy Spirit highlighted that because oftentimes, and this has happened to me as well, the Lord will show us something and instead of having boldness to share what we see or what we perceive or what we're smelling or tasting, we, we hold it in. We don't want to share it because I could be wrong. I could be the only one that's seeing that. Any number of things. But right there... Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. The Lord is encouraging us to boldly speak what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we're smelling, feeling, tasting, because all of it is important. Every bit of it, as we know, we've heard Nancy talk so many times, every bit of it is in a picture. 
Father talks to us in pictures, and He's constantly engaging us in those pictures to get us to partner with Him. Whether it's a picture in the Spirit or it's a perception, a feeling, all of those things are Him communicating with us to come to me, come join me and in partnering with me to have my desires fulfilled in all of creation. So seeing is linked to boldness. It really is. Seeing or perceiving, if we keep quiet about it, we're really truly stifling that piece of ourselves that keeps us from co-creating with our Father. Because as we know in the Word, our Father in Genesis simply spoke in all of creation happened. And we, the word says that we are created in his likeness and image. That means every aspect of our heavenly father is made manifest in us. Every attribute, every characteristic is made manifest in us. It may not be made manifest all at one time, or we may probably explode, right? But We have the promise in the word that if we are created in his likeness and in his image, then that right there gives us permission to allow him to make himself made manifest in every aspect of us, every bit of his nature, every bit of his character. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. That means as we mature, we mature into those places of being all that he is, being made manifest in all that he is, in all of creation. And I I really believe as the Lord has matured me in my process, all of those things that keep us from seeing, I'm going to use that in a broad sense, come from truly fear. Fear of possibly being the only one that sees that particular thing, fear of being made fun of, fear of looking foolish. All of those things keep us from speaking what we know Father is saying in a picture. So that fear of being wrong, being foolish or looking foolish, keeps us from functioning out of the fullness of our inheritance in Christ. We have a full inheritance in Christ that allows us to fully express every bit of Father's nature and character in all of creation. How? Right? How is that stolen from us? There's this little statement that the enemy always likes to use with us as sons, and that statement is, Hath God truly said? He did it to Jesus. He did it to Eve. If you want to turn with me, I'm doing it old school today. I've actually got my Bible instead of my iPad. (laughs) But if you'll turn with me to Genesis 3, verse 1, and you may know this by heart. I'm going to put on my reading glasses. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? Right there. Has God really said that? Is what he's saying to Eve. Now if you'll turn with me to Luke 4. And we're going to start with verse 1. Now this is when Jesus went out to the wilderness and Satan was tempting Jesus. Starting with verse 1, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for forty days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Are you listening to his his verbiage there? Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. 
And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Do you see that Satan himself is quoting the word there? Right? Okay, so then verse 12. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then it goes on. I find it so interesting at the very end, in all of this whole passage, the Lord is making us aware that the enemy is tempting the very truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Every single question, every single has God really said, is challenging, do you really believe that you are the Son of God? Has God really said that? And do you believe it? Every single time. And then the very last portion of verse 12, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. That I found fascinating. As I read that, I realized Jesus was talking to him about himself, but he was also talking to him about, you're not going to steal this from me. I am not going to agree with you that I am anything less than the Son of God because I know my Father's voice. I know his nature. I know his character. And I'm not going to give that to you. I'm not going to let you steal that from me. So what was Jesus saying to him by that? He was saying, you're not going to get me to question the things the Lord has said to me. You're not going to get me to question my father's voice. You're not going to get me to question the promises he's made to me. You're not going to get me to question who I am because I know who my father has said that I am. And I think that that's critical for us, that we begin to truly believe what father has said to us the things that he's shared with us, the promises that are in the word. Those are clear. They're unmistakable. And yet so many times we will listen to that little voice. Has God really said that? We even do that with processes, protocols. I can't do this because this is the normal process. Or I can't do that because this is the protocol that I've learned that needs to go with that. But Those are all wonderful and they're wonderful tools, but they can never supersede the voice and direction of our Father because He knows exactly what needs to be done. If I'm doing or believing or seeing the things my Father is saying to me or showing me in pictures, that is what I have to believe and speak out with boldness as we read in 2 Corinthians. So this summer, earlier in September, my husband and I went to Washington, D.C. to be a part of a team that was running the tent for the call. And the Lord had told us to go way at the first of the year. I didn't even know what it was. I just knew the Father had shown me several things about why we needed to go. And then I found out what all it was a part of. (laughs) So it was kind of after the fact. But however, in the process of preparing for going, weeks or a month or so before we left, the Lord said, you're going to go to Union Station while you're there. So I told my husband, when we were there, baby, I really want to make sure we go to Union Station. I feel like we're supposed to go there. And so this one particular day, we had just gotten there the day before. We dropped our team off at the mall, took our car back to our Airbnb, and walked to the mall from there, it was about a mile and a half, just to see how far it was distance-wise and if it was doable to walk. And we walked around this building on the side and the archway caught my attention. It looked kind of like one of those mirror within a mirror within a mirror within a mirror kind of effect. And I just thought it was amazing. And so I said, hold on, let me get a picture. So I'm taking selfies of Todd and I. And I said, let's walk down this archway. And so we walked down and shortly after walking down, we came to this open door on the right. And I told Todd, I said, let's go in here and see. So we went in and we stepped into Union Station. 
had no idea that was the building. And so, of course, I'm elated because I knew that Father had said we needed to go to Union Station. And so Tom and I just began to worship and thank the Lord that we were there and worship Him and praise Him for His intentions for every person that passed through that place and that they would know Him and know His love and come to know Him in a personal way. And my husband drew my attention to a sign that was for the arrival and departures of the trains. And he said, babe, there's the sign for the arrivals and departures of the trains. And then he reminded me of a testimony of the creation of our Federal Reserve, which is something Father has called Todd and I to be a part of. Anyway, that's another whole nother story. But anyway, he was drawing my attention that this is where all of those men met in the dark of night under false names to get on a train and go to Jekyll Island to create our Federal Reserve. And so, of course, I was elated because when Father months prior said, I want you to go to Union Station, it never crossed my mind that it was because of that. And so I was, I was so excited. And so I asked the Lord, what do you want us to do? And he said, begin to repent for the agreements that the United States has made the blind eye they have turned in allowing things to be created. And so we began to do that and some other things he shared with us. Well, as we're going through that process, I have this thought that passes through my brain that said, are you sure you're supposed to be doing this? Because after all, it's only you and Todd. Don't you need a bigger team with you to tackle such an enormous thing? And in that instance, I went, oh no, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. And so immediately I started getting a headache. So we left the building and I felt sick inside, like something had been stolen from me. And we had done a whole bunch of stuff while we were there, but still there was a piece missing. So after we got home, over the weeks following that, I was asking the Lord, Lord, why did I have that feeling? What was this thing in my head that all of a sudden, instantaneously, I had a headache? What was that all about? And as I sat with him in his throne room, talking about that, the one thing he said to me was, You listen to the voice that questioned what I told you. Hath God really said? And of course, in my thinking, I'm thinking, well, there's a protocol. You know, when you tackle certain things, you should have this many number of people and you never want to do certain things by yourself. And the Lord made it so clear. What would make you think that you were alone? It was you and Todd on the earth. Yes. But did you stop to think of all the angels and cloud of witnesses that were joining you and partnering with you for my purposes? And I thought, oh my goodness, (laughs) learning moment. So even though all of those things that we have, the processes, the protocols, all that stuff, it can never supersede Father's voice. And when we're seeing it, We have to trust him that he has the bigger picture, much better than we do, much better than we do. Our responsibility is to see it, say it, and obey because he's got all the rest. So that was a huge learning moment for me in that we are sons. We are the bride of Christ. We have his full trust. When he sends us, when he shows us pictures, he's showing it to us because he trusts us. When he sends us someplace or we happen to find ourselves someplace and all of a sudden we get a download that you need to pray this or you need to say this or you need to do this, it's because he trusts us. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in that place. You wouldn't see that picture. You wouldn't have that word. But we have to trust that we are sons. We cannot allow the enemy, like he tried it with Jesus, questioning his sonship. Are you really a son? Is basically what he's saying. Do you really think you're a son? I don't know. And trying to put that question in our heart 
so that we let go of the very thing that Father is wanting to release, not only in the earth, in all of creation, in our life, in our intimacy with Him. Because every time we step into that faith of releasing that word or releasing that picture or declaring that something over an area, not only is it shifting the area, releasing all of creation from its bondage, but it is truly affecting our intimacy with Father, with our Lord Jesus Christ. It is bringing us into that oneness in a greater experience where we're truly in every aspect of our being living from that place of oneness with Him, with no separation. If you'll turn back with me to 2 Corinthians 3, I wanted to read verses 16 and 17. Now, we read earlier in verse 12, use my reading glasses. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. And then if we move over to verse 16, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. When we turn to the Lord, The veil is moved. So whenever we're living out of, oh, fear of, oh my goodness, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm going to look foolish. If we have those feelings, our face is not turned to Jesus. Because looking into his face, that stuff doesn't even exist. That is completely contradictory to his nature and character. And so if we're feeling those feelings, that should be a key, a trigger, a signal, a woo, that I am not looking in Jesus's face. And all you have to do is just turn, turn your heart. Lord, I look into your face. And the moment you do, the veil's moved. It says it right here. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That's pretty simple, period. There's nothing else. There's no qualifier in that at all. It's just that simple, that straightforward. So that should be a key factor for you, a signal for you, that if you're ever having that internal whatnot about, oh, I'm not sure, I may look foolish, that right there should tell you, oh my goodness, my face is not in Jesus's face. I'm not looking at him. And he promises that the moment we do, the veil is moved and we can actually see what he wants us to see. We can know what he wants us to know. We can then release what he wants us to release. About five or six years ago, I was in worship and standing in the garden with the Lord. And I saw Father, he was this huge, blue, blazing fire. And he invited me, he motioned for me to come to him. Now, the first moment that I saw him at first, because it was so overwhelming, I truly wanted to turn and go the other direction because it was a little intense, but I didn't. I went and stepped into the fire with him. And I'm standing in this blue fire and he takes my hands and he asked me the question, what do you see? And I began to describe to him the beauty of him and the the flames, these beautiful blue, crystal blue flames and his face and his eyes were, were just light like I'd never seen before. And so I'm describing him to him. And then I stopped. I got to the end of the description and he said, Kim, what do you see? And I'm thinking, okay, what else am I missing? So I looked more intently trying to see all the details that that obviously he was asking me that again because I must be missing details, right? And so I'm going into more description about what I'm seeing, what his skin looked like and his hair and all of that. I mean, it was just remarkable, just remarkable. And then I got to the end of my description and stopped. And he said, Kim, what do you see? And I stopped for a second. I said, Father, I don't understand what you're asking me. I don't understand what I'm not seeing. And he said, it's not me you're looking at. You're looking at yourself in a mirror. And I was 
absolutely undone, landed on the floor in a puddle and just began to sob and sob at the revelation of who I am, who we are. And that's key in seeing is believing like Jesus did when he was confronted by the enemy with, are you really going to believe your father? Hath God really said, are you really sure you're seeing that? Is that really what's going on right now? All of those questions are trying to prick your heart to steal your awareness, your belief of who you really are as a son. You know, when I was standing in that fire with the Lord, looking at myself in a mirror, thinking the whole time I was describing my father, the heavenly father, and the whole entire time I was seeing myself. That blew me away because I had never seen myself like that. And that's where we have to allow our heart to believe truth. Unplug this. Ask Father to renew our mind and really settle it in our heart. Let me see me. Let me see me how you see me, Father. Because that is where once we get a hold of that, It doesn't matter what you're perceiving, seeing, feeling, tasting, smelling. None of that matters. It's like, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm smelling. With boldness and confidence, without hesitation or fear of, I may look foolish or maybe got it wrong, or am I the only one that's going to be saying that? None of that matters because we truly are Father's glory We truly look just like him. The word says we're created in his image and likeness. And I can personally testify to you, we look and are just like our heavenly father. There is no difference. He created us in his likeness and image for a purpose and a reason. And as we step into that and begin to function out of that truth and out of that place, that atmosphere, everything changes. The stuff we know and the stuff we don't know. You know, even that situation with Union Station, the Lord said, sweetie, you did what you needed to do and you can trust that everything you did will bring forth fruit according to my purposes. So even in the stuff that we may stumble and trip or even fall flat on our face, Father is still going to show grace and His desires are still going to be accomplished. But bottom line, we must trust our Heavenly Father when He said, I created you in my likeness and image, that He really, 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 really did. And He fully trusts us. All right, let's pray. So Father, I just thank you for today, Lord. I thank you for your word. I thank you for truth, Lord. And I just pray that every word that was shared today from your heart, just go into every heart and bring forth seed in your likeness and nature, in your character, that your character and nature explodes in every heart to bring forth your manifested desires. Father, I give you all praise and honor and glory for everything you did today. And Lord, when we see the fruit coming forth and we see the manifestation of what was sown today, Lord, that we give you all praise, honor, and glory for it. We give it all back to you as praise. We give it all back to you as worship. We keep nothing to ourselves, but everything goes to you as worship because you first loved us. We couldn't even love you, Lord until you loved us first. So Father, we give you all praise and honor and glory. We worship you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I have three declarations that I am going to release and I encourage you to begin to decree and declare these things over yourself as well. Follow along with me. And of course, as Nancy has taught, get in your authoritative stance, okay? So stand up if you're sitting down and get into your authoritative stance, right? 
because you're decreeing and declaring this not only into the heavenlies, into every dimension, but into yourself, body, soul, and spirit. Okay? So we're going to get into our authoritative stances, and here we go. So, Father, we decree and we declare that we are your sons. Now I'm going to do it one more time, okay? Father, we decree and we declare that we are your sons. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, and here's the second one. Remember, authoritative stance. Father, we decree and we declare that we can see because seeing is part of our DNA makeup. Father, we decree and we declare that we can see because seeing is part of our DNA makeup. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Here's the third one. Ready? Father, we decree and we declare that we are created in your likeness and image, and that truth is made manifest in every aspect of our life. Let's say it again, all right? Father, we decree and we declare that we are created in your likeness and image, and that truth is is made manifest in every aspect of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. You guys have a blessed day, and I look forward to being on here again. <laughs>